<laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, Chris, Chris, you back? Okay, all right. So um, let's go ahead and, uh, and 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 kind of find you know dive in a little bit more on the you know what drove you in to in a beer and eventually wanting to start a non-alcoholic brewery. So you mentioned, and again, I don't I don't want you to feel uncomfortable if you you know you don't want to talk too much about. It. I just want to you know as I mentioned, we're an educational podcast and we talk about a lot of things craft beer and this is something that. I haven't been uh, familiar with ab- about how it affects, uh, you know, your, your, the Crohn's disease, how, how alcohol affects it. So you mentioned that you were diagnosed with, with Crohn's disease. And from what I understand, Crohn's disease is a, is a digestive uh, tract uh, uh, mm-hmm. d- disease or issue that causes discomfort uh, in your bowels when certain, certain foods and, and things uh, are introduced. So, um, can you explain just in general how alcohol affects Crohn's disease and, and what, you know, is, is it something that that people can't, you know, that people that have Crohn's disease, they still choose to drink alcohol even though it causes pain? Or is it something that you really need to get rid of if you want to have a satisfying life? Yeah. So, yeah, Crohn's disease, it's um, it's an auto autoimmune disease. It, it affects the, the intestines. So it can be, you know, like the large intestine is, coli- is called colitis. The small intestine is called Crohn's. It's probably as, as much anatomy as your listeners want to want to go <laughs> yeah. through. But, you know, I, I think, you know, that this is my experience with and giving up alcohol was it was a choice I made. I could have suffered through continuing mm-hmm. to drink it, but it was it was clear that it was something I wanted to give up. That's not to say that that's prescriptive across everyone that has Crohn's disease or any other condition for that matter. I think mm-hmm. a lot of it is about personal choice and personal yeah. um, experimentation and self self awareness of what works and what doesn't for you. And that uh, you know that that goes across whether you have a con- underlying medical condition or you don't. Right? Like mm-hmm. some things agree with you and some things don't. Some things make you feel better and some things don't. So um, you know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go down the hole of saying, this is what you have to do. If you have Crohn's, I think everyone's got to figure out what their own, their own solution and their own journey is. But for me, this was an important, uh, fork in the road. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'm familiar with autoimmune disorders. My wife has been suffering, um, for a bunch of different things that we were diagnosed, uh, about 10 years ago. Um, and one of, of course, one of the things that, uh, irritates her, uh, as well as alcohol and she hasn't been drinking alcohol for a a while now um but the other thing that also affects it is uh is gluten um, because gluten is an irritant to your uh you know to your uh digestive tract um Mm -hmm. so she's doesn't have any celiac or anything but she you know she doesn't eat gluten because of, of that problem is this something that also affects crohn's disease as well or is it not as uh as effective and and I'm just curious if, if that's something else that, that could be um, a, a problem. Yeah. I think a lot of people that have Crohn's disease try to try to minimize their gluten, their gluten intake. It's not the same degree that someone with celiac disease would yeah. have, but you know, I, I think there's a general, you know, if I was to generalize, I would, I would say that people with Crohn's or colitis or inflammatory mm-hmm. bowel disease, you know, more so than the average population take gluten into consideration when they're, when they're choosing what to eat or drink. Okay. Now, by any chance, have you, is it, I know it's already a challenge just getting the alcohol out. Have you, have you considered, or do you have any of your beers that are gluten reduced or, or gluten free? Yeah, I think, I think all of them have, have tested at less than 20 parts per million, which I think is the threshold oh. for, for calling it gluten free. Mm-hmm. The challenge we have is that we do use barley because we, mm-hmm. we brew the beer, um, using some fairly traditional methods, obviously some, some methods that we incorporate are, are different than, than traditional brewing methods, but, you know, barley is a a key component, key ingredient of what we make. And that's a, that's a gluten containing grain. So um, we tend to talk to our customers about the fact that our product is, is pretty friendly for people who are trying to avoid gluten. We have plenty of customers that are celiac and enjoy our product, but we just don't, we don't, 
we don't put that on a label just in case, yeah. you know, someone is ultra sensitive and we do have barley as an ingredient. So, you know, we choose to be um, responsible in, in terms of how we go to market and how we communicate with customers. Okay. That's good. Um, because I did get two of these pale L's in, in my uh, care package and my wife was eyeing, eyeing it saying, Oh, is it gluten-free too? And I said, oh, I don't know. Let me, so I, I'll tell her it's not gluten-free, but it is at a reduced level that most likely won't cause her any, any pain. This might be a, a good uh, treat for her to be able to finally have a beer after uh, a while, not being able to drink uh, any alcohol. So that'd be nice. Yeah. I think, you know, I think we'll go, we'll go down the path of exploring if we can make that claim because, you know, similar to what we've done, you know, for people that don't drink alcohol, you know, if we can do that for people with, with celiac disease or gluten sensitivity and say, Hey, this is a, a great tasting product that's friendly and healthy for you, then, you know, we're, we're broadening out that, that craft beer tent, right? Like yeah. we're making the whole, oh, yeah. the whole category more inclusive. And that's uh, you know, that's something we'll probably pursue. Okay. So um, as we know, uh, in a beer, uh, really kind of, for the most part, early on, served a certain niche type of uh, consumer. And so knowing that, especially back in 2017, I don't think it was as uh, as as popular as it is currently. Uh, what was your initial goal in terms of growth and expansion with the brewery when you decided to open it up? And how has that changed over time? Yeah, the, the, the original plan was just... Uh you know, see what happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was, it wasn't, it wasn't much more sophisticated than that. We, you know, I, I wanted to make something. I, uh, I launched the product on, on a Kickstarter crowdfunding campaign. We did, we did incredibly well there. We raised, I think $30,000 in a, in a one month campaign. So that paid for the first batch and, and a little bit more. And, <laughs> and then we just had repeat customers and we're like, all right, they want, they want to order more beer. We'll make more beer. And, you know, it, it turned into something pretty phenomenal, well beyond my wildest dreams in terms of what, you know, the size and uptake. And, you know, I think more importantly for me, just that that passion within our community and the, you know, we get notes every day saying like, this is life changing for me, mm -hmm. or this is, this has really made, you know, my dad's life better, or, yeah. you know, things like that. Like, that's the stuff that gets you going through all the dark days that happen mm -hmm. as a manufacturer and a a brewer and a business owner, like there's a lot of things you have to deal through, but when you're getting messages like that on a daily basis, it, it makes it so much easier. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I can imagine. So in react, so I guess the simple answer to your question is, uh, it, I mean, the growth, you were going at it just as uh, let's just see how it works. And the growth was completely organic. It just grew as the, you know, as things be, you know, started happening and as the, you saw needs and, and uh, popularity just naturally started growing and expanding uh, in a direction because that's what the consumers wanted. So that, that's good. Yeah. And they, and they became such vocal advocates for what we were doing. Like the people that those, those early adopters that had our product, they like, they would tell everybody they knew they're like, finally someone, you know, sees me, mm -hmm. you know, like yeah. I've been invisible to the marketplace for years. Right. Mm -hmm. And ignored. And now like, these guys actually get it. Like they understand me and they would go out and tell a hundred people. And that's how, yeah. that's how we grew our business. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, one more question for me before we pop over another beer and I'll let Chris take over some, some time here. I did, again, I've mentioned to you that I didn't want to come to this uh, interview. that's like totally ignorant of everything. So I did read up a few articles on you. I did see in Forbes, uh, there was an article a, a few years ago, uh, it kind of talked about how you got, got started and that you were, initially uh, focus on a direct to consumer as a as a direct con to consumer brand um, and we've seen uh, recently with many of our local and on-premise independent craft breweries here locally suffer greatly during the covid pandemic and now did you see or did you find that being a direct to consumer brand helped partake soar into popularity being that you're able to easily ship your product straight to their door during this pandemic that the was it actually helpful? <laughs> yeah, like we we were probably the first, and I, I don't know this for sure, but as far as I know, we were the first ever beer company to launch direct to consumer only. We had no tap room. Mm -hmm. We had no retail distribution. It was brew it, sell it online strictly yeah. back in 2017. So that's 
that's been part of our DNA since, since day one. And, and, you know, I, I think today we have a density of customers where like retail, we do exceptionally well in retail, but at that time we, we didn't have that density of yeah. customers. So we had customers all over the place. How do we reach them? Um, e-commerce was the way to do it. So we've, we've always had that as part of our DNA and it certainly served us well during, during COVID. But I, I'd also say that retail was a huge, huge growth engine for us during those years as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Okay. So it's time for another beer. I, I mean, I finished mine. I want to say that I, I really didn't, I enjoy this pale ale. Mm -hmm. um, I honestly, I wouldn't be able to know it wasn't in a, except for the fact that I pretty clear headed right now. That's the, I, that's the biggest, uh, <laughs> I drank that's the real biggest fast. thing that I'm like, <laughs> I'm missing is that, Oh yeah, I, I, it went down uh, nice and easy. I, I do enjoy, uh, you know, there is some bitterness to it, but not overly bitter. You know, you don't want to pale it'll be too bitter. Um, it does have some substance to it. it you can't, the, you know, the, the hops, uh, you know, do have flavor in there. Um, but again, it's well balanced. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a well balanced pill. Uh, yeah, it finishes with some malt, just... a little bit of malt in the, at the very end too. Yeah. It was nice. It was nice because I mean, you put it to your nose and it's just, it's like tearing open a, fr a pack of hot pellets <laughs> and, <laughs> and you, you just sniff it and it's right there. And it was some floral and citrus notes too. And then you drink it and it hits your tongue. Honestly, if I didn't know it was NA, I'd go, Oh, there's something different about it, but still really good. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't even think twice about it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks guys. Like this, this one, we consider, you asked a question about like the gateway into craft. Mm -hmm. Like we uh -huh. consider this pale ale, our gateway into the partake line. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good one. Yeah. And it's only 10 calories. Well, yeah. yeah. That's on the side of the can too. That's, that's insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. I, I do have a question later on about, about how you, you know about these uh low calorie beers and and uh but again we'll save that for a little bit a little bit later so ted what beer you want to do next uh you guys want to do the blonde next sure. sure let's do the blonde let's now reach into my cooler randomly and see what pulls what comes out it's the one that's blonde in color see it's uh oh that was easy yeah because all i could see was the, the <laughs> color at the top i was like that's got to be it yeah, we, we, we don't get too creative in terms of the styles. It's like people start shot, you know, they, they get used to the color styles and then like peach, red. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the styles are pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. No, no, no. It's branding, right? It, you make it simple for the person that when they know what they want, they don't have to look at a candle. They all look the same and try to figure out which one I want. You know that the yellow can is mm -hmm. the blonde. The blue is the pale. The red is the red. The dark one's the dark. I mean, it, it makes sense. It's good branding. I like that. Thank you. Oh, geez, you've already got it in the glass and everything, Denny. I, I'm on, not man. messing around. I got my lager glass. I poured the blonde into my lager beak cup. It's like, we got stuff to do. Yeah. What time are we wasting with this? <laughs> okay. So, Chris, I'll let you continue on with the, uh, with the interview here with next question. Anyway. Oh. <laughs> As he's taking nose hits. Yeah, I love it. I'd, cracking open a fresh beer and smelling it. It's like one of my favorite things to do. All right. So Ted, how the hell did you guys learn how to brew beer with reduced alcohol? Were you, yeah, were, you this... home, were you a home brew? You home brewed this, right? You, you did this on your own or did you have help? Yeah, I, I did it with a friend who's I'll, I'll give him credit. He's a better home brewer than me, but uh, <laughs> anyways, he, he, this is the story. It, you know, we, we were sitting at the bar and, and I, I given up alcohol by this point and, he was talking to me about, you know, the latest brew brew he was doing on his home system. And I, I was like, all right, well, that's, you know, it sounds pretty easy. Like, do you want a challenge? Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he's, he'd probably been a few beers in. So he's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> he's so, feeling confident. <laughs> yeah. He was feeling pretty confident about his brewing skills. And I, I said, okay, well, how, how's this for a challenge? Make me a, make me a good non-out beer. Like I'm sitting here drinking old duels, um, <laughs> you know, help me, help me out here. And he's like, all right. I can do that. And here's, here's the cost. It's like, you got to buy me alcoholic beer over the time period with which we're working on this. So I think I probably bought them maybe, uh, you know, five or six cases. It probably cost me 200 bucks, but, uh, I ended up with a, a, a great tasting product, at least a prototype of a great tasting mm -hmm. product. And, 
yeah, that's uh, that's kind of the story of how it uh, originally yeah, came to be. And then I was lucky enough to, to get hooked up with some very professional brewers, guys uh, with PhDs in microbiology. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the guys, I, I laugh, it, the beer, the beer uh, listeners out there will, will appreciate this. Instead of a baseball card collection or a beer bottle collection like you have there, Denny, mm-hmm. he has a yeast collection of 20,000 oh. <laughs> types of brewers. Yeast. So I was like, when I heard that, I was like, I want you working yeah. on my beer. Yeah. Nice. Wow. So we, uh, we have really a global audience, Ted, but you know, most of our listeners are in the United States. So how available are Partake beers in the U S they are very available in the U S first, first through online, like e-commerce we're shipping mm-hmm. all across the U S um, from a distribution perspective, we are in 25 States. Um, so, you know, most of the West coast, Colorado, Illinois, Michigan, most of the Northeast, um, I think North Carolina's in there as well, Arizona, Nevada. Um, so lots, lots of states have our product. Uh, if I go to a retail level, Total Wine's been a great, a great partner. Whole Foods has been a great partner. Wegmans, um, Bevmo, uh, Ralph's in California. So, you know, um, Binnie's, Binnie's in Chicago. So lots of great retail partners out there. So um, if you want to find our product, either uh, go to our website and order it online, or you can you can find uh, a store finder on there as well and, and figure out where maybe some close uh, locations to you could be. Okay. Now you had mentioned Total Wine. So Total Wine, we, we definitely have here in Florida. And I know there's a couple of breweries that distribute specifically through Total Wine, like, uh, well, not just, just <laughs> through them, but like Clown Shoes, for example, out of Massachusetts, mm-hmm. right? I never saw them in Florida. And then all of a sudden total wine started distributing with them is, are you guys just in those States that you had talked about? I mean, I know you said about 25 States, but like, does it come to other States because you're partnering with these larger organizations? Yeah, it's a bit of a domino, a domino effect, right? Like you, you prove success in a, in a retailer and then, you know, you take that success and you talk to the next retailer over and say, Hey, look, look what's happening at, Nice. These guys, maybe, you know, maybe your shoppers want this too. And then it just, it snowballs. Right. And so that's, that's how a lot of brands build their business is just like one retail retailer at a time and one success at a time. And that's how we've, we've done it. That's pretty awesome. Uh, so I would imagine you guys outside of the United States, you guys also distribute in Canada, right? <laughs> uh, yes. What, what other, do you guys distribute <laughs> in any other countries outside of those two? We're in uh, Bermuda. So if you, if you ever go there and get your shorts on, you can grab a part. All right. Sweet. That's pretty awesome. Any, uh, any future plans uh, as far as places you guys are trying to get into? You know, we, we have interest all over the world. It's, it's um, you know, it's, it's a matter of focus for us. It's like, mm-hmm. where, where do we want to have the most impact? And I think, you know, Canada, we're the number one non-alc beer, uh, you know, not with, not even in craft, like number one overall, including the macro players. That's awesome. Um, you know, we want to win in our home market. We've won. Now we just got to, you know, we, we still got to build up on it. Like there's, there's room to grow from, from where we are. And then in the U S I think we want to be focused on, you know, serving our, our customers there. And, and, you know, if we spread ourselves too thin, we're not going to be able to serve them in the way that they deserve. So, you know, this goes back to the way I, when I started the business, I, I had a hell of a time trying to service us customers. I had guys really mad at me because I couldn't ship product over the border from Canada because the labels weren't compliant. And mm-hmm. I said, you know, I'll, I'll get this right for you. It might take me three years and it, it took me five years, but <laughs> I got, I got to it. And, you know, I, I think we've still got a, a big job to do in front of us and I don't want to take our eye off the ball. Yeah. But that's cool though, because I mean, you guys can, you can put your time and effort into the places where, you know, you put your focus and then as you kind of babysit those places a little bit and they kind of, I guess, grow up and kind of can handle their own, then you can go focus on some other places too, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. But- yeah. Well, yeah. So, um, I mean, honestly, uh, in the Americas, uh, not alcoholic <laughs> beer has, is really fallen behind and it is, than what it is in Europe and, and you know, Spain, uh, Germany, like, one out of every five beers purchased in Germany is a non-alcoholic beer, which is an amazing stat. Who would have ever thought that Germany, of all places, would have, you know, such a non-alcoholic beer consumption? Um, 
and and here in the states that that we we can't say that's the case right but i mm -hmm. think you know we're it's definitely i was definitely seeing an uptick in the amount of non-alcoholic beers that are available uh more breweries are doing it uh even here in uh you know near near me and the shoots breweries now has a black butte porter that is now non-alcoholic i haven't tried it yet i've um, I want to try it, but I hear it, it tastes pretty close to the real thing. Uh, and, and that's amazing that, that people are able to have beers that like you, like what you're doing, where, where it's not just a single style, you have a, a, a choice and they're choices that are really good and, and tasty as well. Um, so yeah, I'm going, I'm going to Germany next week. So I'm going to raise that average. Okay. <laughs> 1.2 out of five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and you kind of touched on this a little bit already too, Ted, but, and I know for you specifically, it was, it's a, a, a health choice and a personal choice, but why, why would, you know, John Doe drink NA beer, right? Could, I mean, could you explain some of the benefits that, that non-alc beer can provide to, to the drinker? Yeah, I, I can just use examples from, you know, what, what we hear from our customers and they're, they're looking at, you know, we talked about this adulting concept like mm -hmm. so many people are going through you know transitions in their life whether they're becoming a parent whether they're getting a new a new job um you know whether they have a new health and wellness goal or they have a health condition like there's you know the only the only thing consistent in our lives is change right and so a lot of people are going through these changes and they say oh all of a sudden non-alcoholic options make a lot of sense for me like i want to be you know uh, I still want to drink and still want to be social, but I need to get up early the next morning because I've got a, a new, you know, young kids to take to school or I've got, I'm, I'm training for a half marathon and I want to, you know, put in all those reps that I need to, and I can't waste mm -hmm. a day with a hangover. And, um, you know, other people who are just like, Hey, I, I like the taste and I drink two beers as just part of my daily ritual when I get home from work. And now I can do it with something that tastes great. Um, doesn't have the alcohol and is healthier for me with, with, from that respect. And then in the case of our beer, it's like 10 calories. So it's, mm -hmm. it's just, it's just, uh, I think for people, once they sort of open their mind up to it, it, it becomes a no brainer in, in, in so many parts of their, their drinking life. And, um, you know, it, it still leaves them the opportunity to consume alcohol in other occasions. Um, but they're, they're very flexible around that. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, because I honestly just give it to somebody. They wouldn't know. I mean, they, like they might notice something, but no, they wouldn't know. Yeah, the the Blondel is definitely lighter uh, in flavor, um, but it is it does. But you are getting more maltiness out of it, and maybe some. I'm trying to picture. There might. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure what the hop you have in here, but it's also maybe almost like lemongrassy um character to it a little bit really light though um but yeah this one it's, it's a it's a nugget hop that we have in there. it's a nugget okay yeah so uh but yeah but again i mean i've already almost i'm, I'm gonna re get ready to just open our third beer yeah. i think we'll do one more <laughs> just before we let you go uh, but yeah it goes down easy if i have one concern is that for me it's a it's a little bit more carbon the carbonation is a little bit higher than i'm used to that's the only thing i that i have to say is is that definitely i'm trying not to burp too too much here and, and embarrass myself but uh but that's the only uh down down thing i've, I've got to say so far it it tastes like beer um and it tastes good i mean it's i mean i'm enjoying it i am enjoying this and um i do like i will say that of the two i think i like the uh, pale l because of the little bit more hoppiness to it. Um, I didn't like that a little bit better than this one, but again, for someone who doesn't like a strong beer flavor, there's a lot of people like that. that don't like beer that tastes like beer. Mm -hmm. This tastes like beer, but in a light, lighter, uh, you know, amount of, of flavor. It's not going to overwhelm somebody that, uh, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily enjoy beer like, like we do. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a craft beer for someone who likes, likes a, a lager. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's, um, I know I, I'm sorry, Ted, you're probably not done with your beer yet. We're, you know, we definitely like to drink fast on this show. On We're this professionals show, but... when it comes to consuming <laughs> beer too. But, but, but we have, we have a choice of the 
uh, if we do one more oh. beer and, we'll, and what will probably happen is Chris and I will save the other ones and we'll do tastings on air for our next show. But uh, we have the Goza, we have the Dark Stout, and we have an IPA. Of those, which one would you like us to try with you? Let's let's do the Goza. Let's go back to like one of my 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 favorite stout styles in a slightly sour beer. So uh, yeah, let's yeah, try that one. Yeah, I'm glad you picked this one. I wasn't going to. Uh, I was going to let you you choose, but I'll tell you what. Chris was really hoping this was the beer because yeah, he he's a he loves peach in his beer. <laughs> Yeah. And I love Goza, so. Yeah. All right, we should have got you guys to sponsor this one since, uh, you know, you, one loves peach and one loves Goza. Well, man, I'm, try, <laughs> I'm, trying to find, I'm trying to find a brewery locally that'll put my dog. So I, I own a dog training company here locally that'll put my dog on a beer label. <laughs> so I was like, man, it'd be the coolest thing ever okay, to so be able to put peach, my dog on there. Take peach Goza. And I'll admit, I have to hold back some of it because my wife is getting some of this too. Okay, so you, you can definitely smell the peach in it, which is which is a positive thing, right? If you want to have peach goza, you got to be able to smell peach. And I like that it's lighter peach, not syrupy, because it's, uh, at least I haven't tried it yet, but uh, syrupy peach is a little much for me. It smells great. Actually, you know, Actually, this is probably one of the best uses of peach in a beer that I've had because I, I just mentioned I don't like the syrupy character. It's definitely not syrupy. Mm -hmm. This is like you're drinking peach fuzz, basically, yeah. right? The, the, the peach skin off of the peach, right? It tastes really subtle, really – it has that peach essence, but not – the the heavy heaviness to it that i can get with some other peach beers that we i've had i and and just so you because you don't know background between chris and i i don't like peach in my beer so that's <laughs> chris loves peach in his beer yeah i don't like peach in my beer because a lot of times it makes me it it, it kind of gives me that feeling like i have um acid reflux in my throat you know sometimes it can be a little bit too like throw up -y, you know like Hey, this is not throw up. You just so you know, <laughs> That's the best compliment oh, of the evening. Yeah, I'll take that. I'm gonna take that one back to my marketing team. What do you guys think of this one for the packaging? <laughs> it's not throw up. -y. <laughs> no, but it's got uh, a very subtle tartness, which is what a goza should have. Um, and I don't know. It. Uh, I assume there's there's salt in here too, right? Yeah, there's coriander, coriander, coriander? and sea salt. Okay. Very, that's so, very, very subtle too. But yeah, it's, it's very it's subtle, there. but I can, but I, I get the most of it in the finish, right? You mm -hmm. get a little bit of that dryingness in the finish. Um, very slight tartness. Uh, it's a sour for people that don't want sours that are going to remove the enamel off your teeth as well, right? No, I mean, this is like um, beach slash pool beer mm -hmm. all day. Yeah, it is, you know, this, this product particularly does, does exceptionally well in in warm climates like yeah summer summertime you know further south you go the the more this product moves yeah, yeah i bet it's it's well liked yeah yeah uh, yeah I, I approve as well uh and it is it is very refreshing crisp um it is also like i said lighter flavored but in my opinion has just enough like some people might not they want more peach, but for mm -hmm. me, it has just the right amount of peachness to it. So, yeah, like our whole line is really about like get get you the flavor, but it's it's light, refreshing, mm -hmm. sessionable. You know, high on refreshment, um, high on flavor, but but low in calories. So, okay, you know, it's it's it, it checks a lots of boxes for a lot of people. Okay, so we're gonna we're almost finished here, Jet or Ted, and we'll let you. Uh, get back to your your evening but we do appreciate you taking the time and, and talking to us and providing the beers but uh, let's go back to the calories right uh one of the biggest benefits uh that people are looking for in non-alcoholic beers is having a lower calorie uh beverage uh, that's in, that they enjoy uh, and especially one that tastes like beer but without all the extra and we know that often we equate like beer drinkers equate flavor with having more calories associated with it because to get that flavor, you got to have more in it. 
So how do you, you know, how do you, what, what kind of magic do you work to get a good balance where you're able to produce this goes at 15 calories and this pail at 10 calories uh, and still get the flavor that, that you do is, do you have any, without telling your trade secrets, but as far as uh, just in general. Um, yeah, it was somewhat surprising actually in some of our, our early prototypes as we started to do some of the lab work to, to understand the calorie profiles that, you know, some of the, some of the early batches were maybe 40 or 50 calories for a can. And we, we said, Hey, let's, let's experiment and see if we can, you know, we'll, we'll do a couple variations on that. And, and some of the very variations came down in calories to, to half. And we're like, okay, well, let's, let's do that experiment again. And then it came down another half. So we got down into like the 10 to 20 range. And we said, wow, like we didn't see much of a difference in flavor. And so it was just a process of iteration that sort of got us there and said, Hey, we'll make, I think this is a good trade-off. It's like, not, we're not giving much up in terms of flavor, but we're getting a huge benefit in terms of calories. And, you know, when we went to market and started talking to customers that, that that's such a huge thing for us. And, you know, I just, I sat on a plane next to a guy one day and was talking to him about my business. And he's like, Oh, you know, interesting concept, but I'd never drink a non-alc beer because of the calories. Like if I'm drinking non-alc, I want, you know, zero calories. And I'm like, Oh, well you should try our beer. And he called me up after the flight and he said, yeah, I'm going to start drinking your, I'm going to start drinking your beer regularly because it tastes great. And yeah, it's, it's basically zero calories. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's close enough. And um, oh man, I just had a, I had something I was going to say, and well, I just forgot. By, by the time you use, <laughs> expend the energy to open the can, you've already been, you've used the calories in the can. <laughs> yeah. So oh. my, my, my team jokes that, you know, it's, it's basically a weight loss program in a can. You burn more than 10 calories in the act of drinking the beer. So just, yeah. uh, you know, have another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I, I think what, uh, also with what I've heard about, it, uh, other NA beers is, is sometimes they, they might come across a little too sweet or, you know, they, they, cause you can't get all that, that sugar, um, you know, fermented out without generating the, the alcohol content. I, one thing I'll, I'll tell you is that all of the three beers we've had so far, none of them are sweet. Uh, I mean, they're, they're actually, all of them are really dry. And uh, I mean, if anything, maybe the, the blonde, had a little bit of more sweetness, but in reality, it wasn't sweet. It was, it, it everything finished dry. Um, so I, I take it you must have a, a way of, of really drying these beers out uh, and, and keeping the sugar low, which, or, or getting all the sugar out, which is giving you the, the lower calories in, in, the, in the process. Yeah, the, the alcohol certainly is, is part of the calorie, you know, the, the lower calorie, which all non-alcoholic beers would have, but, you know, most non-alcoholic beers are 60 to 90, yeah. some are even over a hundred calories in a non-alc beer. A lot of that is, is from sugar. So you're right. Our, our products are, are drier. They finish drier. You know, that for me, in my experience, when I was drinking other brands before I, I invented Partake was, I really didn't like that sweetness. I thought mm -hmm. it was a, a huge detractor from the yeah beer experience, you don't get that in alcoholic beers, right? You tend yeah. not to have a sweetness because it's fermented out. And so, you know, that was one of the key things I wanted to do in, in a product that I was going to make was, was take out that sweetness and have a really dry finished beer like you're used to getting from, from an alcoholic beer. Okay. All right, Chris, let's just skip down to the last, I mean, uh, I, I wrote a little paragraph here because I wanted to explain this last question we're going to ask ask you so i'll let chris go ahead and all right so in uh about a year ago we did a, <clears throat> a non uh speak chris use your english <laughs> uh, we did a non-alcoholic episode uh it's episode 180 and there's from what we read 10 different methods of brewing beer with reduced alcohol it was mainly by limiting the fermentability of the wort or by boiling it away um or what did we right here? Even running the beer through a semi-permeable membrane. <laughs> that was our favorite. That was our favorite one. <laughs> yeah, that's bringing back. That's bringing back all the fun of <laughs> saying semi-permeable when we're a little buzzed. Um, but Ted, without giving away any trade secrets, can you discuss any of the methods that you guys use to reduce alcohol in your beer? Yeah, I, I would say ours is a is a hybrid. Like, to, like, like your prior guest probably said, like ten different methods, right? 
some of them produce sweeter beers, some of them produce drier beers, some of them produce higher calorie beers, some produce ones that don't taste very good, to be honest, <laughs> right? So, you know, I think the way we approached it was saying, look, we we wanted to look at every stage of the brewing process and say, like, is there a method we can adopt from, you know, these 10 methods that is really the best in class at each stage of that that process and and kind of built you know a Frankenstein process if you will based on all these different different parts but um, you know I think the end result is you know a phenomenal tasting beer at a at a very low calorie and mm -hmm. you know I, I think part of it as well is you know we've been at this for five years and we've iterated hundreds if not thousands of batches of beer non alk beer is I would say is very delicate <laughs> it doesn't right. tolerate misses in terms of the mm -hmm. brewing process in terms of in terms of other parts of the process, the food safety aspect of it is incredibly important. Um, I'd highlight that because, you know, I think there are lots of, lots of breweries coming into non-alc and probably, you know, they, they don't quite understand the food safety that is required in the absence of alcohol. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's something that's pretty important to us. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd leave it there that, you know, I think it's something that can be done, but it's, it's, it's delicate. It's not for the faint of heart and, you know, food safety has to be number, yeah. number one. Yeah. Good point. I didn't, didn't think about the fact that alcohol itself is, a, is a, well, preservative kind of a thing and also a cleaner, right? It's, it's going to, you know, keep things clean. Um, and which brings up another, another question that I didn't write down, but I just thought of it. What's your shelf life? when you when you produce a six pack and you get it out there how how long can it stay out on the shelf before it starts to, to deteriorate or become where it's not as good as it it was when it was fresh is is there a, a shelf date yeah i think we have a we have a best before date of of a year after manu oh. manufacturing which is which is very long yeah um we've tried to standardize all our products on on that i would i would you know, caveat that like the hoppier beers are going to have more, you know, you, it's more noticeable degradation. Yeah. It's not like it's, it's not at a year, it's not a good IPA. It's still a good beer, but it's, it's better when it's fresher. So yeah. I think some of the other beers that are less, less hoppy, perhaps a bit, bit more of a even curve in terms of the difference between fresh and a little older. But, um, you know, I think our products have stood up very well with, very well over time yeah yeah that, that's a good point it, it, does oxid oxidation play as big a part in non-alcoholic beers as it does in is it the same same as in regular beer yeah oxidation is is one of our one of the things we got to keep a close eye on every batch is monitored for for oxygen levels yeah okay yeah i i will say that you're you're right i could imagine that the of the three beers i had if there was any uh flaws in it it was it would show up pretty easily because they are delicate beers that that uh, that i i have to I, i'm gonna tell you uh, your process is very good these are clean beers no i i don't i don't have any hint of uh, of any kind of flaw uh, in the brewing process so you guys are doing some really quality control beer that uh that, that's gonna be good I, I, i'll i'll be honest with you i i'm not i i was uh I was hesitant, right? I was like, okay, I, is this really going to taste uh, as good as they claim? And uh, I have to admit, it does taste, it does taste really good. And I, I am really impressed. Like I said, just said, I'm really impressed by uh, how clean this beer is. It, it really is um, clean and, and well, well brewed. So I just want to raise my, my glass up to you and your, and your team for, for doing some great beer. Yeah, it's 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 all the team today. It's uh, yeah, they kicked me out of the brewery a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and one last question before we let you go: um, What is your current manufacturing uh, capacity that you're brew you're, you're outputting uh, right now? And what and what is your? I mean, are, are you? I know you had a a year or so ago. You had uh, um, some some uh, financing come in to help make this uh, bigger. And what your plans are to to get the the output uh, higher or what's the higher? Yeah. So we, yeah, we, we have the existing upside capacity for, 
what we project will be the next couple of years of, of growth for us. The, the money we brought in, yeah, it's, it's about just opening up some of those, some of those key states for us, those key retail partners and really be able to support, you know, just, just uh, building the brand and getting people aware of non-alc as a category partially, but also partake as a, as a really top-notch choice within within non-alc and we, you know, we're, we're biased of course, but we think <laughs> partake is the best choice within, within non-alc, but uh, you know, part of it is, is tooting our own horn, but part of it is also building the category and just making it better for consumers across the board who can mm-hmm. get better access to um, you know, these, these great products that are now on the market. So that's, that's really the, the uh, use of funds for, uh, for what we've raised and uh, you know, there may be more to come down the road, but I think we're at the start of a, of a really important journey to change the stigma around uh, non-alcoholic beer from something that's negative to something that could be quite positive. Yeah. Okay. Chris, any other questions for Ted? Um, not off the top of my head, no. <laughs> but I, man, with the three that we've tried tonight, I'm, uh, my wife just took the the peach goza and the. Uh, and you're the you're not, Chris. You're not getting that back. I, no, I don't plan to. And I, I told them I let them in on the fact that there was another can of the pale ale in my beer cooler too. So that's probably going to disappear. But man, I am looking forward to trying the uh, the other two that we brought in here. The uh, the red because I love a good red ale. Denny and I were talking about yeah. that yeah, before you got on, and then the uh, the dark or the, or the. Uh, the dark one, uh, but man, phenomenal job. I, I, I'm blown away with these. These are terrific. Thanks. Thanks so much, guys. That's, uh, that's great feedback. I love, I love it. It means a lot coming from uh, beer aficionados like you guys, right? Like, cause that's, <laughs> that's what we've tried to do. We've tried to create this authentic craft beer experience that, you know, guys like you that no beer can, can really say, Hey, look, this is something that's really good. And I enjoy drinking. So Thanks. Thanks so much for that, that feedback. Yeah, you're welcome. So uh, before we let you go, is there uh, any um, social media or anything you want to let our listeners know to come find you and partake out there? In the sure. Way? Yeah. Our, our website's drink, drinkpartake.com. And uh, you can find us on Instagram at partake brewing. And then I think on Twitter at drink partake. So uh, it's either partake brewing or drink partake, but uh <laughs> you know, look us out there. And, uh, on a personal level, I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm very open, uh, connect with me, talk beer. I'm, uh, excited to meet new people. So, uh, yeah, please reach out. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Ted. And you, uh, have a great evening and uh, we do appreciate you joining us and, uh, and, and letting us let our listeners know more about non-alcoholic beer and partake brewing. And for all the samples you sent to us, and samples, thank you so yes. much. Uh, <laughs> cheers to you guys. Yeah, no problem. It was, it was great to be on. I really appreciate it. Denny and Chris. All right. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Well, I think that went, uh, very well. It went a little longer than I was hoping. I I'm glad that, uh, Ted enjoyed the, uh, conversation. And okay, trying, there we go. trying to get back where my notes are. <laughs> well, Facebook went to just uh, just the people who were talking, but now we're back to side by side. So okay, on. there we go. Okay, so we, uh, yeah, it, it went on for a little bit over an hour, about an hour. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. But uh, and Ted, if you can still hear us at all, um, raving reviews from my wife too. She said the piece goes is amazing. <laughs> nice, nice. Okay, so. Um, now that we've, we've got the interview out, let's get back to our regular scheduled program, our regularly scheduled program. And, uh, as, as always, Chris and I would like to thank all of our Patreon supporters. This episode is brought to you in part by our satisfied Patreon supporters like Mike Allen, Bill Schlemmer, Amanda and Kevin Argauer, Mark Reedy, Mike Blanchard, Tara Carlson, and Jim Kutzel, who are virtual producers and Tom Byrne, Jeff Seiler, Johan Halberg. Chad Lamassa, Mark Church, Eric Brownlee, and Matt Knight, who want to buy us a virtual beer. If you enjoy the content we provide, we invite you to support the show by toasting your host or buying us a virtual beer or even becoming a virtual producer. You can explore the options on our support page by visiting patreon.com slash tap the craft. So, Chris, we got an email from Jim Kutzall. Mm-hmm. Uh, as we remember, they were on their beercation in Asheville, North Carolina, yep. during our last recording. 
and uh, they, they want to just write in and, and talk about uh, about the different you know things they did. Uh, it's it's kind of long. We'll get through it. But I thought this was uh, very enlightening for anyone who wants to go visit Asheville uh, to get some insight on some of the breweries and some of the act, you know, some of the things that they did. Because I thought it was it's you know it's it's good knowledge for for oh, me yeah. and for everyone. So I'll well, go ahead and start I, off. And I'll, oh, I was I was going to say because you know Jim puts a lot of detail into this because yeah. you know I go to places and I go it was good you should yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. I, had a beers, yeah. yeah I went to this place this place i had fun it was good you should go uh yeah. so you no, know he, he tells a story so let's go ahead i'll start the story off and we'll just push back and forth and we'll get we'll get through it uh in less than three voicemails so here, here we go so <laughs> he, he starts off by saying tara and i stopped in greensboro north carolina for friday night to break up the trip from southern maryland uh, well, from Southern Maryland. Greensboro is an up and coming beer town. We especially recommend Joymonger's Brewing Company. All their beers were above average. They also have a great location that abuts to a small city park with benches and tables. You are even allowed to consume your beverages in the park. Ooh. They also had a fantastic taco truck the day that we were there. And by the way, we had more than our normal share of tacos this trip. Uh, we Man arrived in my Ash own heart. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Who doesn't like tacos? We arrived in Asheville on Saturday mid afternoon. After getting settled, we took a three mile walk to visit the well in West Asheville, which is a venue co owned by his nephew, Ross. They just opened their fourth location last weekend. Wow. Is that all four in Asheville or four locations around different areas? I'm assuming, right? They wouldn't have four wells in Asheville. I mean, I you think. never know. Yeah, I think it's in different different locations. <clears throat> um, and here, here, I like this part. So we tried many more beers than we could count. It was also nice to just go up to the bar and say, put it on Ross's tab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A good thing we weren't driving that day. You, you, can, you can go on now. All right. Well, while we're, while we're getting into that, too, I saw a bunch of people hopped on, too. Uh, Eric Gronley still on with us. Connor Larson up in Maine. Uh, and my buddy Russ Swenson. How are you, pal? Uh, Mark Church is on there with us also. Um, so let's see. On Sunday, we took a long walk to visit the Wedge Brewing Company. It turns out it wasn't their locate, it wasn't their location that Tara wanted to visit, but we picked that up later in the week. Find Munich Dunkel four caps with tacos for lunch. <laughs> Walking back, yeah. Look, I guess Asheville's kind of a taco town, then, huh? Yeah. Walking back, we stopped at High Wire Brewing for a break. Night, nice, light, hazy pale ale, four and a quarter caps. Met Ross and family in the early evening at, at a Zillicoa Brewing Brewery and enjoyed some live entertainment. The place was crowded. Uh, Jim said the locations are in Greenville, South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina, and East Asheville for the whale. <clears throat> the place was crowded. It was the only brewery that had par a parking attendant directing traffic. <laughs> <laughs> damn had a nice light rice pills four caps for that one that hit the spot this place was on tara's list to try some smoked beer then it was back to the whale to close out the night i love the concept of ross's tab <laughs> i bet you do man <laughs> i'm just gonna go in and tell him to put it on ross's tab too oh uh, that's good stuff all right, Monday, lunch took us to White Labs Brewing Company. They started out as, and still are, a yeast manufacturer. They created the brewing side of the business just as a way to showcase their yeast strains. They offer multiple versions of the same beer, with the only difference being the yeast, in order to sample the difference the yeast makes. Their wood-fired pizza was the best of the trip. I would go back just for the pizza. Beer was good, too. I gave four and a half caps to one of their English pale ales. After touring the botanical gardens, we made our way to the wedge at Foundation so Tara could take pictures of all the murals <laughs> that, that that part of town is famous for. I enjoyed a nice light English mild that I gave four caps to. We ended up at Burial Brewing for dinner, a great burger enjoyed with a couple of pints of Profit Maker, their light hazy pale ale, which I gave four and a half caps to. Okay. Tuesday morning, we met up with one of my fraternity brothers and his wife who retired in the area and took a day hike up the summit of Mount Mitchell 
the highest peak east of Mississippi. Uh, about five miles round trip with the uphill portion being mostly strenuous. As you can imagine, this generated a great thirst. We stopped hmm. in a venue called Juicy Lucy, which had a great selection from lots of different breweries. I had a couple of pints of Queens Crusher, another light hazy pale ale from Wicked Weed that earned four and a quarter caps. Later that evening, after getting cleaned up, we ventured out to One World Brewing that was in the basement and had a speakeasy vibe to it. It even had the, side, the sliding viewer in the door. The beer was more than just acceptable, but not noteworthy. Terror was taken with the Dutch shuffleboard setups they had. Wednesday was low key, just taking in the sights of the city. We had lunch at Highland Brewing Company's downtown tap room. It's in a food court in this. It's in a food court in the center of town. More tacos washed out <laughs> with yellow slaughter. Their standard pour of this is 20 ounces. I gave it a four and a quarter rating, but in retrospect, I should have been higher. We went to the actual brewery on a previous trip, but that was before untapped. So we didn't have any records. Walking around, we stumbled on Twin Leaf Brewery. My favorite out of the couple of flights we had was Luminosity, a Belgian triple coming in at 9% ABV. It earned us uh, earned a solid four caps. We also found our way to Bramari. Bramari. <laughs> I, I, I just look at it. I just like, ah, I just, I had to remember what the, somebody Bramari. told me. Just the H yeah. is silent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and had a sleeping pigeons, which is a Munich Dunkel. It was fine, but a little sweeter than I like. Tara indicated that the beer she ordered was on the sweet side as well. We capped off the day with another visit to Highland Brewing Tap Room for another fine Hellas lager. And uh, I'll just say this real quick. Tara chimes in here, says the only brewery on my list we did not get to was Cellarist. Um, could not talk Jim into wood fermented farmhouse sales. Next trip. <laughs> mm, yeah, I'm, I'm with Jim. <laughs> <clears throat> but, you know. It's a nice place to visit. So on Thursday, it was a driving day partway home. We stopped in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, which is on I-95, just about a half hour south of the Virginia border. After checking into our hotel room, which was a tiny house, we walked across the parking lot to explore Rocky Mount Mills. It's a refurbished old factory that's well worth a stop in if you're in the area. In addition to offices, shops, and restaurants, it's a it's a nursery for startup breweries with a nice little beer garden that they share. There's also a bottle shop with taps. The mills allows startup breweries to use their equipment and provide them with a space for a tap room. Some of the breweries have grown enough to establish their locations as well. There are currently a half dozen breweries, a bottle shop, and several restaurants that serve beer as well, all in different stages of maturity. We had a great evening of sampling and more tacos for dinner. <laughs> I'm starting to sense a trend. There's beer and tacos. Mm -hmm. And then there's more beer and there's more tacos. Anyway, Friday was the drive home with a well-deserved rest because on Saturday, our daughter and Dell got married. We celebrated with many bombers we obtained from the whale, probably on Ross's tab, <laughs> and the Rocky Mount Mills bottle shop. Looking forward to our next trip. Wow. Thank you, Jim for that uh, very nice detailed story of yours and Tara's uh, beercation. We really appreciate it. Sounded like it. a great our, trip. Yeah, and, and you definitely gave a lot of information for our listeners to take in and uh, you know maybe they'll stop at a few of those stops on their visit to Asheville as well. All right, well, if you wanna be like Jim and uh, write us an email and tell us about something about beer, uh, you can do that easily. Just email us at tapthecraft.gmail.com. Or if you'd rather just chat with us on Twitter or Instagram, you can do that at tapthecraft. And of course, we are on Facebook at facebook.com slash tapthecraft. And of course, we have our very own website at tapthecraft.com. And let's continue the conversation because now it is time to untap the craft and see what our listeners are drinking according to Untapped. So about 20 hours ago, and I pulled this up before we started our uh, conversation with Ted, Eric Gronley checked into a barrel aged Speedway Stout from 2018 uh, by Alesmith Brewing Company. He said, oh, yeah, no, that's a nightcap. Bourbon still <laughs> coming through nicely, very smooth chocolate and a hint of coffee, four and a, uh, four and a half caps 
for that beer from Eric. Um, Let's see. Mike Allen is checking into a handful of things. One check in he had was a black sheep ale by black sheep. Um, And he said, strange note on this tastes a little like grilled cheese. Strange. (laughs) I know, but it is what it is. Three and a half caps for that beer. Um, Scrolling on up. He is also checking into um i can't pronounce that one mike it's at the durham brewery but but it looks like uh jerry low uh three and a half caps for that one um alex fuchs i can't pronounce those beers either buddy sorry <laughs> but he's drinking it at the brew shop and ah, uh but but it uh, but it was a uh, five cap rating for that one um florida steve drinking out of his uh Grogu glass. I almost called him Baby Yoda, but that's, you know, kind of sacrilege. <laughs> He's drinking an IPA by Finkel and Garf Brewing. Pretty good IPA, he says. Citrusy, slightly dry and low bitterness. Three and three quarter caps. Uh, moving on up the list. He's also drinking a Frosé Space Eli by Kings Brewing. The sun will come out tomorrow. Delicious fruited sour. Thanks, Nick. Four and three quarters caps. Oh, moving on up. Matt Knight is drinking a tropical pineapple Kolsch by Genesee Brewing Company. He said getting the camper cleaned up four and a half caps for that beer. Um, This one I can do. Alex Fuchs drinking a Hoppy Joe by Lervig. Uh, four (laughs) Four cap rating for that beer. And then he also had one uh, McConnell's by Thornbridge, Thornbridge Brewery that he gave four caps to as well. Robert or chew your beer is drinking and always glowing by Highland park. First in my community to untap this beer, buddy, you're on, you're first to untapped a lot of those beers, which is pretty (laughs) awesome. All the citrus fruit in the world in one glass, four and a half caps. Uh, Let's see, scrolling up. People have been doing a little bit of drinking on this uh, holiday. So that's good. Good. You guys are getting your check-ins in. Um, Let's see. Oh, there's a fun one. Matt Knight is drinking a Dell's Black Cherry Shandy by Narragansett Brewing Company. Uh, Nice beer for chilling by the fire. Three and three quarter caps for him. Um, Robert, again, is drinking a Magic Actually by Highland Park. First in my community to untap this beer's Wowzers. Amazing. Four and three quarter caps uh jeff s is drinking a trellis buster by crooked stave lovely hazy double ipa from crooked stave not sure what a trellis buster is but i know it's really tasty four cap rating for that one um let's see there he is i knew he had to be in here somewhere chad lamasa is continuing his check-in streak by drinking an amulet by pipe the side brewing company delicious Loving the hot bitterness, very crisp and refreshing, very crushable. Don't think this crowler will last very long. Five cap rating for him on that one. Uh, Bill Schlemmer is drinking a TDH triple pixel density by phase three brewing on the back patio at draft and vessel on an 88 degree day, drinking a fine, juicy, hazy triple IPA really smooth for a nine plus percent beer. That's a good hot summer day kind of beer right there. Uh, Four and a half caps for that one. And let's see. What what happened here? Oh, okay. Um, This has got to be Jeff Seiler. It just says Jeff S though. Mm -hmm. Because it's in North Carolina. Okay. Um, He's drinking a, that's what happens when you put ketchup on a hot dog by Hoof Hearted Brewing. He said it's Memorial Day. Time to remember those who sacrificed all and time to grill hot dogs. Now, who puts ketchup on a hot dog? Not me. No. (laughs) Mustard, chili, and onions, or kraut. I can't do ketchup. Three and a half caps for that beer. He's drinking out of his B cup. And last on my list, and I'm sure when I refresh this, because this was two hours ago. Something else will pop up. Eric Gronley is drinking a left-hand pass by Labyrinth Brewing Company. Holy moly, this is a great beer to close out the day with. Cherry, sherry, oak, and smoke going on. This is a complex, 
and wonderful. Scotch barrels are so smooth. Mm-hmm. I guess that's the, the, the barley wine he <laughs> opened up. Five cap rating for that beer. Hit and quick refresh. And let's see. Yep. Hey, Chris. Yeah. I'm going to step out and use the little boy's room. Okay. Beer. I'll get a, I'm going to get a, a beer to come finish off the show. So you can just carry on. I got okay. one more to read, but okay. 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 But go get a beer. Okay. <laughs> and use the little boy's room. Okay. Uh, I'm going to drink this. And my last check-in is going to be from Art Warcheck. He is drinking a Neapolitan bourbon barrel dark apparition by Jackie O's Brewery. Give it a four cap rating for that beer. And let's see. While Denny's gone. I can fill out a, fill into any couple that we might have missed. Craig Andrew is drinking a You're Never Out by Escape Brewing Company right here in the Tampa area. He said, wifey likey, topaz, mosaic, and Vic secret hops. Fruity, hoppy, and fragrant. Four and a quarter caps for that beer. And that is what everybody is drinking. So guys, if you want us to read your check-ins on our show, make sure you follow me on Untapped at mck1345 and we usually read the majority of your check-ins from uh, 24 hours prior to recording so make sure you get those check-ins we record every other monday at 8 30 eastern time and if denny's gonna go to the bathroom i'm gonna go too so we'll be right back Oh man, I leave for a split second and Chris disappears on me. Leaves me alone to do the show. Well, I'm pouring myself a Ninkasi Dawn of the Red, Red IPA. I've already had two of these before we start recording. I figured I needed to have a little bit of, uh, you know, alcohol. I'm back, Danny. I'm coming. A little bit of alcohol to go with my non-alcoholic beer, but there's the new label on Down of the Red. Oh, I like it. It's it's not really too different, but it's still uh Yeah. It's still yeah, about the I same. You missed it. Yeah. So here here's what I'm uh following up all our non-alcoholic beer with. Christmas ale or <laughs> frosted frog Christmas <laughs> barrel aged. It's Christmas time. Uh-huh. So, but you know what? I opened that before we started the episode. It's still cold. It's still cold. Yeah. You know why? Because it was in my frost buddy. Frost buddy. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So let's continue on with. Man, I'm sorry. I'm still burping up the carbonation. Carbonization, carbonization in that beers were a little bit strong uh, for me. <laughs> it, it was. They were. They were a little bigger on the carbonation. But yeah. Yeah, Man, those were so good. Yeah, but they were they were good. I did enjoy them. I'm looking forward to trying the next two. We'll, mm-hmm. we'll do the next two on our uh, next episode. We'll yes. just do some tasting with those, and since we have a wide variety, but but now it's time for Beer Speak 101. This is where we briefly define a common and not so common beer terminology. In this episode, we're going to explain what it means when we talk about diacetyl. Did I do diacetyl already? I don't think I did. Did I? Not in the beer speak section. Yeah. yeah. So for anyone new out there that hasn't been listening to us for a while, we did talk about diacetyl as a, a yeast byproduct that can be, a neg- most of the time it is a negative uh, um, it's an off flavor. Off flavor to a yeah. beer. 
They say that some beer styles, it's okay to have some in it. In my opinion, no beer style should have it, but that's just my opinion. But, but what is this? It's a volatile compound produced by some yeast, which imparts a caramel, nutty, or butterscotch flavor to the beer. Also think of um, movie theater butter flavoring. You know, you get the, on the buttered popcorn at the theater, mm-hmm. that, that type of flavoring. That, that's another type of flavoring it is. Uh, this compound is acceptable at low levels in several traditional beer styles, including English and Scottish ales, ales uh, Czech pills, Pilsners, and German Oktoberfest. However, it is often an unwanted or accidental off flavor. And uh, like I said, in my in my like, I don't ever want to taste diacetyl because I don't. Like, <laughs> I mean, I I enjoy a Werther's butterscotch candy w- once in a while, but I don't want it in my beer. No, no place for that. <laughs> no. So there, there, there's that's what diacetyl is all about. So now you know another <clears throat> beer term. Okay, well, Chris, it's time for our new and noteworthy beer. So what new and noteworthy beers have you had? So I uh, drank both of these yesterday while I was in the pool, you know, hanging out in the sun, floating around in the pool. Why not have some citrusy kind of beers? The first one was a sunny little thing from Sierra Nevada Brewing. Um, and it was, it's a, uh, an, a citrus wheat ale. I mean... What else could you want when you're floating around in the pool hanging out? Yeah. Right. Um, four cap rating for that one. Just super simple, not super heavy. I think it's clocking in at 5%. Um, just a great pool beer to enjoy uh, while you're outside. Yeah. The second one, we've talked about this a lot. I even posted a goofy video of this video <laughs> or of this beer a couple of days ago. Um, new, new Belgium's Voodoo Ranger Juice Force Hazy IPA. I uh, gave this one four caps as well. And this has got some big citrus flavors in the front of it. And like you discussed, Denny, when you first started talking about this beer, there's no way that's nine and a half percent. I know. I know it's, it can catch you off guard. <laughs> Rather quickly. Uh, so I had two of those in the pool yesterday and it was a wonderful day. Uh, and while I was finishing those up, I was calling my buddy Connor over at Gasparilla Pizza and placing an order for dinner, which was delicious. Nice. Um, but those are my new and noteworthy beers. Nothing too exciting. Um, just uh, we'll get in the no- uh, really super awesome, great things, you know, once the playoffs start and I'm sitting there watching oh. hockey. Okay. But Denny, what's, uh, what's on your new and noteworthy list? So uh, I just had these this weekend myself. Um... Uh, and they're from Jim Danny Brewing. My daughter came for the weekend, and uh, she brought me uh, uh, two four packs, mixed mixed four packs with some beers from Jim Dandy. And um, there's three of them I hadn't had before. Uh, and the first one I'll talk about is uh, Jim Dandy Brewing's Class Act New England IPA. And this is what I say about this is it's a it has ripe tropical citrus fruit on the nose, transitions to more of an overripe melon in the flavor. Uh, hazy with a soft, medium body, creamy mouthful, fill, uh, a real class act for a flavorful, hazy IPA. Another treat for my wonderful daughter. Four and a half cap rating. And in the second beer, I only have two beers on my new and already as well, uh, is Jim Dandy Brewing's uh, Berm Turn American Pale Ale. And this is has tropical fruity hops on the nose, followed into the flavor uh, crisp, refreshing, and bright. A nice, easy drinking pale with a good balance between the malt and the hops, with neither one outshining the other. Uh, thanks again to my daughter for bringing the beers. Four and a half cap rating. Um, and that's it. I, I mean, I've had some other beers, but nothing that was really like mind blowing. So I didn't want to. I knew we were going to have kind of a longer show with the interview with Ted. So I didn't want to, you know, mention, you know, things that weren't really truly noteworthy. So. There we go. Wow. So I guess that brings us to the end. Is there anything else, Chris, that you want to talk about before we close this? That's going to be a nice, uh, well, about an hour and a half show. Yeah, we were about an hour and a half. Look, we're, we're getting kind of consistent with those. So Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, let's go, let's go ahead and uh, let's raise a glass. So who'd like to raise a glass to tonight? Well, I have to raise a glass to Ted Fleming with Partake Brewing for hanging out with us. 
And then also for sending us a sample of their beers. Uh, there's just some terrific beers, man. And I, yeah. we, we've said this so many times. I can't wait to try the other ones. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, what about you, Denny? Who would you like to raise a glass to? All right. First off, I want to raise my glass to our Patreon toast tonight. Goes to our buddy Tom Byrne. Thank you, uh, you know, for your long-standing Patreon support. You know, Tom was actually the very first Patreon that we had. He was, he literally signed up moments after it went. The website went live. Like, I was surprised how quick he was to uh, jump on that. But thank you, Tom, for being longtime Patreon supporter. Also. I want to wish a happy birthday today to Dave Zalatoris from Beer in Front Podcast. Today's his birthday, uh, and he's taken the week off from podcasting to enjoy uh, some time off and enjoying turning 55. Happy birthday, Dave. Happy birthday, Dave. And also, as mentioned in the email from Jim, congrats to Andel on her micro wedding and marriage uh, this last uh, week. So cheers to you and your new husband. And of course, being Memorial Day, uh, I want to raise my glass uh, to my great uncle, Denny. Uh, again, passed away uh, as a prisoner of war in the Philippine um, prisoner of war camp uh, in World War II. So, uh, and also all those who uh, have sacrificed and lost their lives in protection of our freedoms. Uh, thank you and, and just toasted to you. and. And of course, all servicemen, uh, you know, and veterans. Uh, every every show, I raise my glass to you. But I'm going to continue raising it to you. Thank you for your service. I hope you're able to return home safe to your families very soon. And Chris, why don't you go ahead and give a toast to our sponsor? So I want to raise a glass to Frost Buddy. They specialize in cooling containers for your beverage of choice. Frost Buddy has the Universal Buddy 2.0, which is the world's first universal can cooler for 12 ounce cans, slim cans, bottles, and even 16 ounce cans. Frost Buddy also has the world's first universal wine cooler, 24 ounce stainless steel mugs, and even stainless steel dog bowls. Visit their website at frostbuddy.com. And you can find the beers and links to Partake Brewing uh, in the show notes located on the show post at tappedtocraft.com. And if you'd like to follow us on social media, I can be found on Twitter, Instagram, and untapped at Loose Screw. And Chris, how can I just follow you? So as usual, never on Twitter at Chris underscore McKenzie 82. Or you can find me on untapped and Instagram at MCK1345. And of course, you can always interact with us on everything social at Tap the Craft. All right, it is last call. It's time to bring the show to a close. We want to thank you for downloading and listening, and we ask you to please tell a friend, and of course, subscribe on your favorite podcast app. And don't forget to rate us on your favorite podcast app as well. And as a reminder, we do release a new show every two weeks. Now go out there and spread the good word of craft beer. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>